This is the Memory and Resistance Laboratory podcast. I am Latipa, Director of the Memory and Resistance Laboratory and Associate Professor of Media and Cultural Studies at the University of California, Riverside. The Memory and Resistance Laboratory is a hub for anti-racist, decolonial, and feminist of color artistic research. In this podcast series, Memory and Resistance in the Time of COVID, students from UCR interview people across the fields of education, art, medicine, and labor organizing to ask about the larger political, social, historical, and economic impacts of our current circumstances for vulnerable communities. In this episode, we are joined by Audrey Tang, a Taiwanese free software programmer and Taiwan's first transgender digital minister. She has been lauded internationally for her work in creating digital tools to help contain the coronavirus in Taiwan during its initial outbreak. Audrey Tang is interviewed by Jimmy Chen, a fourth-year student in media and cultural studies at the University of California, Riverside. Hello, everyone. Today we're joined by um, Audrey Tang, Audrey Tang, the Digital Minister of Taiwan. And can you tell us what exactly does the Digital Minister do? Because I think most of us have never heard of this title before. Sure. So uh, I wrote my own job description, which I'll read it here. Uh, my job description says, When we see the Internet of Things, let's make it an Internet of Beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear the singularity is near, let's just not forget the plurality is here. So the point here is to um, change the uh, perception of technologies so that the technology adapt to people, to the social norm, rather than people adapting to technology. And the government trusting the people with social innovation capabilities instead of people blindly trusting the government, making the state transparent to the people, not the people transparent to the state. That's my main right. So your job is to um, close the gap between government and the people so, through technology. Um, the, the, the trust gap if you would say so, yeah. Um, Basically, with social media, people trust each other uh, more uh, with more online mobilization. Uh, At the same time, there's filter bubbles, there's polarization uh, that makes it harder for the government to listen well to the people and to trust the people with um, innovative capabilities to participate in policy making. So my work is to make sure that people can listen to each other at scale. Right. And so before we talking about the pandemic specifically, what kind of measurement does the government take when there is an outbreak of any kind? Mm -hmm. Yes. So uh, in Taiwan, when we have an outbreak of a um, epidemic, uh, there is a CECC, the Central Epidemic Command Center, um, setting up. The idea is that there is a single point of press releases, press conferences that happens every day at 2 p.m. and the journalists uh, can work as partners to ask the CECC anything. There's also a single hotline, 1922, where everybody can pick up and tell um, anyone uh, who with the tip, with the innovation or whatever, uh, tells the CECC what their idea of counter virus is. And so all this command center was built uh, with the um, previous traumatic experience of SARS uh, back in 2003. Then there's constitutional court rulings, there's administrative and legislative reforms that enable this kind of a, a rapid response uh, CECC system. And for COVID, when did Taiwan um, first discover it and when um, did they first take precautions against it? 
Yeah, so um, we first learned about it in December 31, uh, when Dr. Li Wenliang, the PRC whistleblower, uh, shared um, uh, essentially SARS has come again, um, and with um, evidence to back it up on the PRC social media. Although very quickly he got censored and disciplined uh, by the PRC social media, by December um, 31st, it, the, the post has been reposted to the Taiwan equivalent of Reddit or the PTT. Uh, and a very early morning that day, uh, the Center for Disease Control uh, staff learned of that from the social media. And so very next day, uh, Taiwan began health inspections for flight passengers from Wuhan. That's to say the first day of this year. And um, you've just uh, developed this app called the eMask. Can you tell us a bit about it? Sure. So the eMask is a simple app or website um, where you can pre-order uh, the mask supply. So anybody with um, anything um, that resembles a digital ID, it could be the national health insurance card, it could be the citizen's digital certificate, um, can easily, uh, without too much uh, hassle, uh, pre-order their weekly uh, rationed masks um, quota. So <clears throat> at the beginning, it was uh, three every week, but now we're uh, progressing because we've been ramping up the production to nine per two weeks. And that's for adults, uh, 10 per two weeks for children. So you just pre-order, uh, choose your nearby convenience store or supermarket, uh, and then collect it the next week. And once you collect it at a convenience store, you can also swipe your NHI card there and uh, renew for uh, the next uh, iteration. So you go back two weeks later and um, purchase uh, again uh, the same nine or 10 masks. And so this is very convenient and by far the most people choose uh, to use the kiosk at a convenience store of which there's more than, I guess, 11,000 um, in Taiwan. Um, what about the foreigners and visitors that are in Taiwan during the pandemic? Can I also use this app? If they are residents uh, that stay for more than six months, they are eligible for the national health care, which is single payer universal coverage. Uh, and of course, they enjoy exactly the same rights. If they are very short term visitors, they can uh, go to a nearby pharmacy and show their uh, passport or um, um, I think uh, permit uh, for entry uh, and then uh, purchase right away instead of pre-order, just purchase it off a nearby pharmacy, of which there's more than 6,000 pharmacies anyway. Uh, and so this also enables um, people to develop, for example, the uh, store uh, stock map, the real-time stock map of the masks uh, in pharmacies so that uh, you can check your chatbot or a map or even Siri or Google Assistant um, right before you go out to know which pharmacy near you still have masks installed. And when the pandemic first spread through um, worldwide, the U.S. had a large um, shortage on masks and the um, prices skyrocketed. Do you have any thoughts on that? So uh, we had, of course, uh, anticipated that. So we nationalized uh, the mask supply. Uh, and to date, uh, we make sure that we secure uh, sufficient supply, which is about 15 million per day. Although our manufacturing capability is beyond that, I think we're very close to 20 million per day now. Um, the extra ones, of course, we donate to uh, our international partners in need. We donate a lot to the U.S., um, as well as uh, very soon when we exceed even 20 million uh, per day, uh, we will also manufacture it for um, international trade as well. But uh, previously, I think um, we began with only 1.8 million per day. So we ramp up the production capability by more than tenfold. And how has the daily life in Taiwan changed because of the pandemic? Well, most people wear masks. That's the really the, the change because people already have pretty good uh, hand sanitation uh, habits anyway. Uh, and so we built upon it a um, culture of mask wearing whenever uh, you get into the public places, um, you wear the mask and uh, people take uh, temperature checks when entering a, a more closed room. Uh, and other than that, nothing much. Uh, the schools took two weeks to prepare uh, for the social distancing and hand sanitation uh, equipments and protocols, but otherwise businesses and school uh, open as usual. In um, past interviews, you talked about 
um, humor over rumor. Can you talk about it? Sure. So the idea of humor over rumor is to make sure that the clarifications, the scientifically accurate information spreads faster than conspiracy theories. Uh, and you can look at it actually with the epidemiologic point of view. Because the conspiracies, um, if they spread to a person, the person, if they don't click share, if they share to less than one person in average, then the rumor doesn't go viral, the rumor dies down. This is exactly the same um, as the R0 value uh, in the uh, epidemiology. So our work is essentially uh, making sure that our clarification messages are very cute through a spokes dog uh, or um, very creative packaging. Um, it elicits uh, from the viewer's point of view uh, a sense of fun, a sense of humor, which spreads faster and easier. And once you feel fun or humor about one particular scientific information, um, the conspiracy theories will not uh, make you feel outrage. Uh, and if the outrage, um, which is a uh, emotion with the high uh, R0 value is not there, it tends to not go viral for the conspiracy theories. And some, there are some people that may think um, by making humor out of um, serious situations that... Um, hold on a second. Some people might think that by making humor out of um, serious situations that you're making light of it. How do you make sure that it doesn't backfire and make more people angry instead? Sure. So, for example, when uh, our premier, Su Zhenchang, uh, makes fun of himself, he makes sure that he doesn't make fun at the expense of other people. So that's a very easy way of shaping it. It's basically saying that uh, we do not uh, denigrate or divide the society when we make the, the memes, um, the, the viral packages. Instead, we just make sure that this is a, a good humor, a, a good sense of joy, of fun, instead of a uh, kind of hidden revenge or a hidden uh, outrage. Uh, that's um, kind of the pretext uh, of the humor. Actually, the, the term humor instead of satire or, or whatever um, already indicates that this is a, a more um, um, socially pro-social uh, way of joy instead of an anti-social way of uh, making fun. And since the, um, most of the world has handled the pandemic pretty well so far, is there anything else that you would like to um, implement going forward? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, quick, very quickly, I think we're uh, working on a travel bubble uh, where, as you mentioned, there's many places in, ta uh, in the world that has also uh, seen essentially zero uh, domestic cases uh, for consecutive days now. Uh, and so between those places in Taiwan, maybe there's no need to impose a strict 14-day uh, quarantine. Maybe we can combine it with a set of rapid tests and reduce uh, the time uh, that each um, origin as passengers have to spend uh, in home isolation or quarantine uh, in the other jurisdictions. So that's the next step we're working on to enable, uh, re-enable um, limited uh, international travel. Okay, and that's all the questions I have. Do you have any last comments that you would like to make? Sure. So um, it's important to note that all the digital technologies are there just to assist the epidemiology work. And so it's essentially important that people uh, learn also about epidemiology. And that's why our previous vice president, Dr. Chen Jianren, the authority on epidemiology, um, recorded a online massive uh, course, the uh, MOOC uh, a crash course on epidemiology. And I think that is uh, useful, um, not only because he shares his expertise, but also he, he takes such a humble attitude, saying that even though we know quite a bit about SARS, this is SARS 2.0, and, and, and we are still figuring it out together. And so uh, the increase encouragement of the society to learn from each other, to share whatever innovations that, that we have, and also to make sure that um, these uh, are not top-down orders, uh, can actually strengthen the democracy instead of harming it during the response to the pandemic. Thank you so much for your time.